Jira, pure, mine, nation, mine, west, land of the setting Aten, the setting sun. O Jira, mine, the purified nation, Apura Kandu, Apurai Kaitnu, African people, black people, in the land of the setting Aten, sun, the western hemisphere. O Jira, mine, the purified nation, spirit genetic descendants of our ancestresses and ancestors of Apura Ka, Apurai Kayet, Africa, who were forced into the western hemisphere during the Musuo Kesie, the great perversity, the enslavement era. O Jira Man, spirit genetic descendants of those Apura Kani, Apurai Kaitni ancestresses and ancestors who maintain their our ancestral religion, culture, and identity as a nation, and therefore effectively wage war against the whites and their offspring, massacred the whites and their offspring with metal armaments and through chemical and biological weapons of warfare, thereby forcing the end of enslavement in North America, Central America, South America, and the Caribbean. Ojirama, spirit genetic descendants of those Apura Kani, Apurai Kaitni, ancestresses and ancestors who established independent, sovereign nations, towns, cities, secure in their sovereignty in the Western Hemisphere after liberating themselves from enslavement through war. Amanie, nationism, Apura Kani, Apurai Kaitni, nationism. African Black Nationism, the recognition of the Apurakani Apuraikaiti Nation, the African Nation, the Black Nation, as a living, breathing entity, an organic entity of which Apurakanu Apuraikaiti Africans, Black people, are a component part, an organic entity governed by a unique spirit of which each Apurakani Apuraikaitni individual shares. Individual function, family function, clan function, ethnic function, the building blocks and governing structure of nationism rooted in the unique energy of the region of Asase Afua, our fertile earth mother upon which we dwell and the blending of Apurakani Apuraikaitni ancestral blood circles governed by specific Abosom, deities within the Oman, the nation, reflective of the divine order of creation. Amanie, nationism, Apurakani Apuraikaitni nationism, the purification of nationalism, the completion of the task begun by our ancestresses and ancestors, the restoration of our spirit genetic identity, our clans, our ethnicities, our collective function as Ojirama, the purified nation of Apurakanu Apuraikaitnu in the Western Hemisphere, restored upon our own sovereign territory in Apuraka, Apuraikaitnu, and in the Western Hemisphere independent, self-governing, and secure in the absolute defense of our sovereignty and the complete eradication of our enemies. of a known universe. We've always recognized that to be a substance. Prior to them studying quantum or quote-unquote discovering quantum mechanics, quantum physics and so okay. forth, they just said blackness was a void in space and that, that's all it was. 
our people have always recognized it to be a substance. And there are male and female expansive and contractive forces that govern that substance. Now, once they began to look, based on our cosmology, when you look at science and the so-called discoveries that they come up with, it's always based on them studying our cosmology. Whether it's the physical sciences or even the social sciences, when you look at psychology and so forth, you'll see Freud sitting there in a picture and he has comedic, comedic deities, statues all over his desk. You look at Carl Jung and he's studying the E. King Oracle and so forth. All these different things, they're always looking at our cosmology and then looking back to fashion some you know, um, theory of the unfolding of creation. They've always done that. So that includes quantum mechanics and so forth. So when they began to look in that direction, then they quote unquote discovered that wait a minute, this substance is really a substance. Now they call it dark energy and dark matter and everything is contained within that and it, it has, you know, um, agency. So, but we've always understand that we have names for them because we are attuned to these forces in creation. So that black substance, expansive and contractive, is within which everything that takes place. It is called Kai Kaiat. It is the great soul and divine consciousness of Amen and Amine. So just like you have consciousness, you can form something in your mind, you can form an idea in your mind right now. In the darkness of your mind, you can form an idea, you can form a thought, you can form an you know, um, endeavor, and then eventually you can give birth to that. You can form it, but then you can also shut it down. You have the capacity to direct your conscious to form ideas, form thoughts, form desires, and so forth. So Amen and Amenet utilize their consciousness, their Ka and Ka'et, to begin to form creation. So that black substance is all pervasive, it has the capacity to take any shape, form, and so forth. Just like water has the capacity to take shape, any form, shape, and so forth. This is that black, watery substance, the primordial substance of creation. Now, they decided to act on that black substance, to expand and contract within that black substance, to give some vitality, expansion, and contraction. So they gave birth to the divinities Heku and Heku, and that's expansion and contraction. And that expansion and contraction that took place within the black substance caused the black substance to begin to move and wave, expand, and contract. Just like if you add heat to water, a pot of water, it begins to wave, it begins to vibrate. That expansion and contraction. So Heku and Heku in ancient Kemet are the male and female forces of expansion and contraction, vitality and breath. This is why the term He means breath. He also means heat. It also means eternity, boundlessness, and so forth. Because that breath or that expansion and contraction, your breathing is consistent whether you're asleep or whether you're you know, um, fully awake. It's boundless, but it's vitality, expanding and contracting and generating heat. So that expansion and contraction was the birth of Heku and Heku. The water substance began to wave. And once it began to wave, first expanding and contracting, then generating waves within the black substance. The generating of these waves is, are the deities Noon and Nunet. And even when you say Noon, it's a vibratory frequency. The expansive is Noon or Nu. The contractive is Nunut or Nunet. That's the expansion and contraction. So that primordial energy was birthed from the vitality or the breath um, force upon the black substance. So it's similar to a pot of water. You can pour some water in a pot. It's just still, it has the capacity to take any form, but it's not being acted upon yet, so it's just sitting there. That's the original black substance. That's the consciousness that has the capacity, infinite potential, and so forth. But then when you decide to give heat, he, and breath, he, he, hu, he, hu, which is like breathing, then you cause that water to begin to expand and contract. And eventually it begins to wave, and you see waves moving throughout the pot. So now energy is moving within that substance. That's the birth of Nun and Nunet. Now it's a primordial energy that's moving back and forth within the substance. When that wave energy begins to wave so rapidly that it generates spheres that rise up out of the black substance, and those are, or the water, and then those are bubbles, and then they pop. When they talk about the primordial black substance waving, generating um, active energy, it became so rapid that spheres rose up and exploded within the black substance. That was the first expansion of light and, cre and heat and fire within the black substance. That's the explosion of Ra and Ra'et, the creator and creatress, creatress, the first fire and light 
that pierced the darkness and carved down black spheres within the darkness. That's the great dwarf creatures rising up out of the moon and moon that. So that's that cosmology. That's the cosmology of Afuraka Afuraka. Now, and you can see the same thing with, with the pot of water. So, that's an image of Nanet and Noon, Newt and Nu. That's how they operate on the uh, macrocosmic level. When Ra and Riot, that fire and light begins to pierce through the black substance, then their spiraling energy begins to carve out black spheres within that black substance. And those black spheres become the first stars, and if you look in physics, they were called stars, black bodies. And they talk about black body radiation. That's the spiraling energy of Ra and Riot carving out black spheres in the primordial black substance. Those black spheres, once they're carved, the energy of Ra and Riot penetrate those spheres and illuminate them and, and irradiate them. And they begin to uh, glow and so forth, burn, fire these the first stars. And one of those stars eventually is our Aten, our sun. And from the stars, you know, the matter comes from stars that generate the planets and so forth. Then the planets are fashioned. So as you can see, that unfolding of creation is written in our cosmology. And this is true across the board where ever Afurakani, Afurakani people are, where we exist, every language and so forth. We have descriptive titles of these divinities. So when the primordial earth is formed, it's a black sphere. Then the energy of Ra and Riot penetrates that primordial earth to enliven it, to give it vitality, to give it life. And then the uh, lighter portions are separated from the denser portions. The lighter portions becomes the atmosphere. Of course, the denser portions become the solid earth with the primordial ocean around that. That atmosphere, a spiritual force operates with that atmosphere. One of the children of uh, Shu and Tefnu, you have Yev and Nu. So we won't go through the whole piece, but when you look at the goddess Nu, and she's bent over scroll up just a little bit. Just want to see if I have the image there. So you see from blackness, then that explosion of firelight, and then the spheres that carved out of that. I thought we had an image there. Oh, well, we're going to show. When you see the goddess Nut, the Umtaro Nut bent over with the stars in her body, when you look at the planet or, or the surface of Earth, the crust of Earth, and you see the stars in the sky and the canopy over that, you see the female divinity encompassing and bent over the male divinity, and you see the stars in her body. So when you see that divinity Nut at the top, you see the stars in her body. She's operating on the microcosmic level around the planet, that primordial substance that um, surrounds the planet, in the same fashion as her great grandmother, the great goddess Nun or Nunet, is operating on a macrocosmic level. So we just want to bring that out. So the key with regard to that is Nun and Nunet is the primordial energy, the root energy of being. You have the vitality of Hehu and Hehu, that expansive breath, expansion and contraction, but then they cause that wave energy to be birthed, and then you have that wave primordial inert energy, but then once it begins to wave very rapidly, it generates spheres, and that's the birth of Ra and Ra, and that's why Ra and Ra rises out of new. Okay, go down. Down again, keep going. Okay, now, there. Just a little bit. Okay, so now we talk, we, that's the etymological or cosmological roots of peace. Now, per Angnu, now we're going to talk about the house of life. Go down. Now, we talked about that new symbol carried by our ancestresses and ancestors all over the continent. You see the same new symbol that represents a place, a space, a polity. When you look at the female divinity, Nu, she's wrapped around the earth and the stars are in her body. So at the night sky, you see the stars in the body of the goddess that's bent over. That is a sacred space. 
within which everything that's going to take place, just like the womb of the mother, everything is taking place within that. So when you see the symbol of Newt representing a city, a state, or a polity, a nation, a governmental structure, then that's a space or a place within which all activities are taking place. And this is why this is important with regard to nationism, the purification of nationalism. We're talking about what a nation really is. When people naturally coalesce, when you look at your organs, they're made up of a number of different cells that all work interdependently upon one another. That's a natural coalescing of cells that have similar uh, needs, interdependent needs, and they come together in a natural way to function in harmony with one another to serve the parent organ, but then they serve the whole body at the same time. Your organs and glands are miniature nations, or aman. When we come together and coalesce naturally, not because we're forced together, but when we come together naturally because we're drawn through ancestral blood circle ties and pushed by the abosome, the forces of nature to come together in a natural way, and we coalesce into a specific group in, in a specific region of Asaseapua, and now a nation has formed, and then we function together interdependently. So when you talk about a space within which something is happening, whether it's happening in the womb of a mother, but it's happening within a nation, state, a specific region or a space where we're drawn to a region of the Earth Mother to um, act in harmony, function in a harmonious way. This is representative of that, that newt symbol. And that's why it's a determinative for nation, state, polity, and so forth, society. The Dikenga, the Congo, and the Bakongo tradition is simply a replication of that. So when they were using that and still continue to use that cosmogram, whether it's on the continent, as well as our people here in the Western Hemisphere. They practice the Congo tradition, sometimes they call it Palo Mayombe. They practice Congo tradition, and they have the Dikinga, and they draw it in the, in the soil and so forth. It represents the four positions of the sun. You see the different color coatings, talking about the, for example, the Kala, the black phase, and the east reaches it. Uh, the sun reaches its height, misses most energy during the too cool of the red phase, sets in the west, the November gray-white phase, goes into the underworld where the process of conception and rebirth occurs, the Musoni, the yellow phase. They're talking about the lives of um, our people replicate this cycle. We rise with the sun, reach our most vigorous activity at the hottest time of the day. We begin to cool down around the evening point, become more introverted, more contemplative, cooling down, studying, paying attention, you know, family time and things like that, and then we go into the quote unquote underworld when we go to sleep, to sleep, regenerate, regenerate ourselves, and then we rise with the sun again. And when you look at the cycle of life, we're born, that's like the sunrise, to reach our highest activity at the middle phase when we get older, you know, the sun begins to set on our life, the horizon of life, then we crystallize, the body crystallizes, the spirit separates, and then when the spirit goes into the ancestral realm, the, the underworld, so to speak connecting with the ancestresses and ancestors of our blood circles, and then eventually we reincarnate through Bebra, rebirth, and return uh, through the rising of the sun within our lives. So that, that whole cycle is manifest. Um, so, not only the, do the Congo people have that symbol representing that sacred space, whether it's a political space, a spiritual space, physical space from the body, the womb, where activity is taking place, um, in the brain, which is the womb of ideas, a sacred space where activities are taking place that are harmonious, a sacred space when we naturally come together politically to engage in a harmonious fashion. So you have the nude symbol, but then two variations of the nude symbol from ancient Kemet, and then you have the Abain symbol in the Akan tradition. Akan tradition in Ghana and Ivory Coast, but also the Hoodoo tradition in North America. We still use Adinkra symbols in North America. When you look, for example, in D.C. Or, or New York or all over the South, and you look at the iron works in the gates, you see the Adinkra symbols all over the place because our people were forced to work these iron works, but we had that skill with blacksmiths and so forth. And we carved these Adinkra symbols and brought these Adinkra symbols in this iron and so forth. But So that's still... Here, but you see the same Abayan symbol. The term Abayan in Akan literally means government. So the exact same symbol um, from ancient Kemet is still utilizing the Adinkra symbols, which are simply Medutu in the Akan tradition. We talk about, um, there's a specific proverb. Oh. So you can 
you see it says online, move, yeah, they are. And then we'll be what peace and progress a society, a nation, and a mind community knows may be indicated by what prevails in the households in that society. So it's talking about the first society is that microcosm, the nation in miniature, which is the household. So we say in our common culture, the mind is recognized to be a microcosm of the created order, the macrocosm, a society, and a mind is a social order rooted in the divine order of creation. This order is replicated in the structure of the households which govern themselves as a mind in miniature, nations in miniature, and further within the individual inhabitants who learn through the various stages of life, naming ceremonies, rites of passage, marriage, elderhood, eldershood, ancestorhood, ancestorhood, how to govern themselves in harmony with divine order. And go down. Um, the abine structure is also found in the, oh, I, I need to move so, but the ohene kra komuade. That is a specific, uh, basically a medallion that's worn by the king as well as the queen mother. This is a graphic representation, but then this is an actual gold symbol. And you see sometimes the Akan kings and queen mothers wearing this symbol right around the chest. It's a Akini king or queen mother's kra soul um, amulet, basically. What it deals with is worn around the neck. It's a protection for the kra, the soul, the divine consciousness. Now the term ka in kaya, soul, divine consciousness, the spiritual force that's in the head reach. It's like you have a physical body, and you have a smaller body in your physical body, which is the brain, which regulates all the functions in the physical body. Your spirit body, we call sum sum. You have a smaller spiritual body in the head region. That is the kra, or krawa, the ka, the kaya, the soul, the divine consciousness. It is a deity that takes up a residence in the head region in Afurakani and Afurakani people and our people only. That force in the head region that's always pulling you in the right direction even if you go against it and then you go against it and then you find out later that you made you know, a bad decision and you say something told me, something in my head told me I should have went this direction and I didn't. Typically that's the Kra direct you. Sometimes it's an ancestor and ancestors giving you that extra push but it's rooted in that force. It's a force in nature moving in another direction. Whether you're moving, clearly it's something else taking place. If you're disobeying it, then it's not you making the decisions. Clearly it's something else. So it's the, the ka, the ka. So that is a, a symbol that um, deals with the purification of the ka, the ka, the kra, as we call it in our common. So it says the spiritual sustenance is paramount as a sovereign or imbalance in the head leads to imbalance in the body, community. Just like imbalance in your head, your thoughts, intentions, and actions leads to imbalance in your body, eating foods or putting things in your body that causes problems. Imbalance in the head of society leads to imbalance in the body of the community. The king is a representative of the people to the ancestresses and ancestors. On balance, the queen mother is a representative of the ancestresses and ancestors to the people. So we know sisters can be very receptive Come possessed by the ancestresses and ancestors and bring them through as a vessel to communicate to the people they are representative of the ancestresses and ancestors right before us. Just like the king, he becomes a representative of the people, everything that's happening in the community, in the Oman, in the nation. This is an elder, an elders in the in the clan, the Patrick clan, Mantra clan becomes a ruler, elected ruler, and so forth. Everything that's happening within in the society. He becomes the sum total of that, and when he goes before the ancestresses and ancestors, just like before libation, whatever's happening in the body of the community is summed up in the head of the community. So if there's imbalance in the head, that represents there's imbalance in the body. So we want to purify the head, whether it's physically, individually, or communally. And that's what the, that cross symbol is dealing with, wearing that symbol to deflect any negative projections, any perversity coming from people who engage in negative ritual practices, discounted ancestral fears of non-relatives trying to influence somebody negatively, leading to mental illness and various different things, physical illness, all these different things. So that that Okinikra is actually conceptually and functionally a newt as well. In the Yoruba culture, the priests and priestesses of Ifa Oracle of Divine Wisdom utilized a divination trait called the Oponifa. Scroll down. So that's the Oponifa. And when you see the newt next to it, um, I'll scroll up a little bit. 
Oh, okay, let's go back down. Scroll down a little bit more. I think the settings were thrown off. I just wanted to show you. Uh... Okay, so when, when we did the, um, once we used the uh, symbol here, I'm, I'm sorry, once we use the projector, the projector itself threw off some of the settings on the article. So, but this is in the book, you'll see. It should be stuck in the book. Make sure it wasn't thrown. Yeah, so in the book, you'll see it's, um, it's there. So we show that there, there are quadrants in the utilizing the Oponi Fa. <coughs> so when they're casting the Ikin or they're making marks, um, with the uh, divination powder, so to speak, the Iyero Sun, the divination powder on the Oponifa is divided up into quadrants, and then depending on, you know, what's coming out in the Odu, you can determine what's taking place within the quadrants. Even sometimes when people are casting Obiabata on a particular trade, they can determine based on the quadrants what's happening. Um, it gives a more detailed Divination, especially when people have clear insight when they're clairvoyant, their audience, and so forth. They're not just technicians memorizing patterns and repeating what they memorize, because that's not really divination. So, what we show is the same Newt symbol, that fourfold division of creation, and then we also show that in the Okral Kra complex, the fourfold division of the brain the cerebral cortex, right and left hemispheres, the cerebellum, right and left hemispheres, governing every aspect of, of life. That shoes face is at the top of the Oponi Fa. He sits on the perimeter of the created order and so forth. Okay, let's go down. So now we get to that original symbol in quote unquote zodiac, the original zodiac going back to ancient Kemet, the temple of Het Heru and Dendera. So that's the actual symbol or actual carving relief. And then this is a drawing of that. It represents the various constellations in the sky. I had a, a picture of you know, a circular picture of constellations that that represents. Scroll down. So, we show here, um, Newton Gebb, Gebb and Newt, um, and we talked about the stars in her body and so forth from a side view, and then we show the actual depiction of, you know, the canopy of the sky and the Earth's crust that's Gebb and Newt. Okay. So that's that original symbol. So we see the new symbol in ancient command represents that state, place, nation where sacred, harmonious activity takes place, whether it's in the womb, whether it's in the, the head, the spiritual brain, whether it's in the society, whether it's in an entire nation. And then the Dikinga, Dia Congo, same situation, dealing with the different phases of life, all aspects of life, the four cycles of the sun and so forth. In the Akan tradition, the Abain, the symbol of government, and you also have the Okini Kra Komuade, talking about the government, the king wearing that symbol to protect himself, to keep himself spiritually balanced, but it's also talking about self-governance. When you're dealing with your Kra, regulating your thoughts, intentions, and actions, that is self-governance. And then the Oponi Fa divination uh, tray, when you're engaged in that kind of divination, what you're trying to deal with is every aspect of creation can manifest in the patterns that show up on the Oponi Fa. So you're still talking about a sacred space where an activity takes place. And then of course, um, the original newt, the original symbol from where this newt comes from. Okay. 
So, and go down one more. So then we get into the progression of life. Um, you can scroll down some more from that. Who been awareness and behavior cycle? So this is the key. We have to lay the cosmological foundation for that new symbol first, and the reason why we use um, that particular symbol. Now, the term Uban in ancient Kemet references the rising of the sun or any celestial body. It thus references illumination and awareness. So we say after a seed is planted or embedded within earth, the seed germinates and the roots reach downward. There is a commingling of the seed's roots with the nutrients and water within the soil. The next major stage of development is the upward push above the surface of the soil. The new sprouts show themselves to the world and to the sun. The next major stage of development is the full flowering of the plant and the maturation of its fruit. The next stage is the harvesting of the fruit or the detachment of the fruit and the leaves of the plant. As the fruit and the plant's leaves return to earth, new seeds eventually embed themselves within the earth and the life cycle repeats itself. Okay, so we show that cycle there, and we talk about uben and awareness, illumination. The key is with regard to, and we're talking about uben, awareness, and the behavioral cycle. And this is why we utilize this ancestral newt, the per ank newt, as a cosmogram in our Akura whole life interventions therapeutic model, rooted in ancestral religion, not pseudo psychology. And we're going to show why how it's connected in that way. Afurakani, Afurakani people are the seed people of earth. <coughs> Function in harmony with this life progression in all aspects of our existence. It is important to understand that the unfolding of our behavior as it relates to a thing, object, deed, entity, uh, condition, event, issue, dilemma, etc. is an orderly cyclical process. This order process is replicated within the structure of the pair of new. So in pseudo-psychology, and psychology is, even though it's misdefined, they will say, um, ology talking about the science of the psyche, and psyche means soul or spirit, so it's the science of the soul or spirit, but psychologists are not scientists of the spirit. They, they're not, you know what I'm saying? They're drugging people up, giving them Risperdal and everything else. So, um, so they're not really that even they're utilizing that terminology. We did a broadcast on uh, therapist or the rapist, Ancestral religion versus psychology. So if you spell out therapist, it actually spells out T H E R A P I S T, the rapist. So if you're a therapist, you don't have to be the rapist. And in this culture, the therapist is the rapist. Mentally, that's what's happening. We're talking about ancestral religion versus psychology. Again, Freud was, was sitting at his desk with images and sculptures of the deities of our ancestresses and ancestors, the forces in creation, and trying to formulate ideas based on the cosmology of ancient Kemet, when you look at Carl Jung and these other crackers, you'll see the same thing. They're taking ideas from our cosmologies, they're weaving them into some pseudo-psychological uh, uh, model, and then putting it forward and so forth, and, and renaming it, relabeling it, but gutting the cosmological foundation. So they'll say that things are just happening to people, sometimes based on what happens to them physiologically, but they just have conditionings and something is happening they don't understand, and they need to get to the root of it. Our behavior follows this orderly cyclical process. It unfolds just like this process we're talking about with regard to the seeding and so forth. So, the behavioral cycle, that's talking about spiritual, because it's physical actions are simply a reflection of what happens spiritually. The behavioral cycle as illustrated through the development of the seed is directly related to the positions of the Aten, the sun, and the per Ampnut. Per Anut is a cosmogram which delineates the life cycle of the Aten, the sun, and by extension, the life cycles of all created entities in the world. We put created because everything that exists in the world is not created with a capital C, meaning divinely created. You can have a plant like the coca plant is a naturally occurring entity. That's a created with a capital C, divinely created. If a cracker takes a coca plant and takes it into a process, into a factory, and turns it into crack cocaine, it exists, but it wasn't created. The Supreme Being didn't direct somebody to make crack cocaine. So it exists in the world, but it's not a naturally created entity. Crackers are not naturally created entities. They exist, but they weren't created. They haven't been here for billions of years. We're the only people who were created. 
their degeneration of the original. Just like cancerous cells exist, but your body didn't say, hey, I'm going to create some cancer cells today. Something took place, some bacteria got in, caused the degeneration, and they manifested as that degenerate corruption of a cell, but they weren't created as that. So that's why we say created entities, the life cycle of all created entities. It can thus be employed as a visual guide to enhance our awareness of the orderly cyclical unfolding of our behavior. The aesthetic of the pair on loop below is derived from Bakango de Kinga, Bakango symbol, with modifications, however, suited to the needs of Ojeda Man, the purified nation, Afurakani Afurakani people in the Western Hemisphere. Pair on loop is also the foundation of our Afura whole life interventions therapeutic model. So, um, go down. So we give information about, so you see the symbol, the upper uh, hemisphere represents the physical world, lower hemisphere, the spirit world, you have the line of ma'at, female aspect of divine law, the vertical line of ma'at, male aspect of divine law, and we're going to get into that, scroll down. Okay. So the upper hemisphere, like the upper half of a cosmic calabash, so you go outside and you see the canopy of earth and so forth, represents the physical world, Tawi. The lower hemisphere, like the lower half of the cosmic calabash, represents the spirit world, the Dua, pouring libation into the earth that is the gateway to the ancestresses and ancestors. So you have the upper hemisphere, lower hemisphere. The horizontal line of Ma'at is the gateway from the physical world to the spirit world and the spirit world back to the physical world in the context of birth, death, and rebirth, renewal. The horizontal line of Ma'at, it separates the physical world and spirit world, Tawi and Dua. It also references the surface of earth, which includes land as well as water, and we, we show that, of course. The upper half of Tawi, the upper half of the world, also references our externalized consciousness, the surface, speech, disposition, demeanor, behavior, while the lower half, the spirit world, the duat, references, references our internal consciousness, what is under the surface, senses, thoughts, intentions, energy responses, emotions, things that are going on within you before people actually see what you're actually feeling. That's, that's in the underworld until it comes to the upper world. Okay, scroll down just a little bit. Okay. Now the, the it looks like the projector has uh, you know kind of thrown off the. <coughs> projector's kind of thrown off the. It's lined up in the book as you've seen. Let me see what, what page is that. Thirty-five. Thirty-five. Okay. So. But we're going to go through the life cycle and we're going to show how it applies to every aspect of behavior. Everything we engage in goes through this orderly cyclical process. Every time you have a thought that manifests as a behavior, it goes through this cyclical process. And they're actually governed by ancestresses and ancestors, the deities, ancestral spirits. If you get in alignment with them, if you do not, you're going to have disordered thoughts, intentions, and actions. So the seeding and embedding is the first piece. The physical, the spiritual perception, seven senses, taste, touch, hearing, smell, sight, and the other two are balance and time. The whites and olive sprinkles say there are five senses. The Greeks started pushing that, but really seven senses. If you don't have a sense of balance, everybody would be falling over in their chair right now because you wouldn't be able to balance yourself. If you don't have a sense of time, that also includes space and spatial considerations, you wouldn't know how far that table is and you reach for it and mess it. Because you don't, you, you don't, time and distance and space are all connected like that. So, and, and you can understand the difference that that sense of time, if you fall asleep or if you wake up, you hit the snooze for five minutes and you fall back asleep, then you have a dream where you do a great number of activities, only to be awakened five minutes later, you know in the physical world you could possibly engage all of those activities in five minutes but you had all those experiences in detail. It's a different time-space continuum when your spirit is operating as opposed to operating through the physical body. So that sense of time. So seeding and embedding, the spiritual, physical, spiritual senses, we talked about that. And there are spiritual senses, just like you have taste, touch, hearing, and smell, and so forth. 
the spiritual senses of the spiritual aspects of those. You can see physically, but then some people can see beyond the physical, they're clairvoyant, they can see an ancestral spirit walking around, deity walking around. You can hear physically, some people can hear beyond the physical. Clear audience, they can hear their deceased grandmother who made their transition speak to them and so forth. People are clear sentient, they can feel spirits. So every physical sense, there's a spiritual sense as well. So first there's the seating piece physical senses, that's, that's your first connection. Germination, rooting, thoughts, rooted truth, and new ideas or condition, beliefs, intentions, we're going to get into that. Sprouting is the next phase. Energetic reaction, emotion responses linked to truth, ideas, beliefs, manifestation of thoughts. Flowering, maturation, actions, manifestation of intentions, harvesting, seeding, harvesting of results, seed formation, and better. Okay, go down. So we're going to go into close in detail. So first, contact. And this is again, Iyad was talking about time and the African time and so forth. When we talk about our uh, New Year celebration happening around the autumn equinox, that's the sun setting, akin to the sun setting in the west. So sun rises in the east, uh, highest point in the sky at the summertime, as well as the noontime, it sets in the west. That's the end of the warm cycle of the day. In the year, that's the end of the warm cycle of the year, that's akin to the uh, autumn equinox. And then when the sun sets in the west, that's akin to a seed being planted in the ground, and it goes in the ground, and then the fire of the sun begins to um, enliven what's in the ground. But that seed being planted in the ground, that's the end of the warm cycle, that's the beginning of a new cycle, that's the beginning, that's the harvest time. But then when you harvest the fruits, you take the seeds out, and you um, seed at the same time. So your first contact is akin to that seeding time, after the harvest and the seeding time, when we come in contact with an entity, engage an issue or hear a dilemma, witness an act or an event, etc. This contact, engagement, hearing, witnessing is akin to the planting or embedding of a seed into our Sasea for the Earth Mother. The unfolding of our behavior begins with our perceiving the entity, deed, issue, event, etc. through our sensory organs. So the first contact you have with any issue, any individual, anything that's happening, that contact is through the sensory organs. Our sensory organs have physical and spiritual manifestations. So either, you either hear something, see something, taste something, feel something, smell something, or spiritually see something, hear something, taste something, and so forth. That's your first contact. That's the seeding phase. We receive and perceive through our physical and spiritual senses. This perception and reception to our awareness is akin to the reception of a seed into our sasea for the earth mother. Through our perception, the seed or the issue has been planted or embedded. So you see somebody or you hear somebody say something, that's contact through your sensory organs. And whatever they said just got seeded into you, just got implanted. Just like a seed going into the ground, that's the first contact. Okay, let's go down. Then the germination takes place. Once the seed goes in the ground, then it begins to germinate. And you see um, the little germination coming up and begins to root. So when it germinates, the roots come out. The roots go down deep into the soil first. So once the seed issue is embedded into our awareness, our senses are stimulated. The seed issue is a matrix of energy which germinates developing roots which delve below the surface of our external awareness deep into the roots of our consciousness and connect with the root energy of our being. Newt, ignited thoughts and intentions about the entity, the event, or issue. So as soon as you hear somebody say something or witness something or anything else, that's the first contact. You have a sensory contact. That experience is seeded within you. Once it's seeded within you, then germination takes place and then the roots come out and they start going down and they hit your root energy of being. Deep within your consciousness we access the actual value, the truth of the entity that we just came in contact with or the object, deed, or issue. So if we really perceive it and attune to it, we can understand the actual value of it or we can go to a shallow depth and retrieve the embedded conditionings or new conditionings related to the entity, deed, event, or issue. These conditionings may be accurate inside the circle or inaccurate outside the circle based on how we have been influenced, programmed, and or how we program ourselves. Whether we access the value, the truth of the presenting issue, 
or ascribe inaccurate value to the presenting issue. This is the germination of thoughts, consciousness, and intentions, energy, related to the presenting issue. Our thoughts and intentions regarding the issue have germinated and taken root. So therefore, you come in contact with somebody, someone says something, someone does something, you see something, hear something, feel something, that's the contact, that's the seed. Then that's seeded within your consciousness. Then the germination takes place and the roots go down and it stimulates your root energy of being. And then you have a series of thoughts based on what you just perceived. The thoughts can be based on truth. If you go to fully deep down in the root consciousness of your being, or your thoughts that are generated based on what you just experienced could be foolish. It could be inaccurate because you've been conditioned and you have a foolish reaction, a set of thoughts based on what you just experienced. And then the intentions that you generate based on those thoughts, you start generating energy, you have thoughts about what you just experienced. If the thoughts are intelligent because they're rooted in the truth, then you generate some energy that's going to support some action that's based on truth. If you have a foolish condition thought associated with your experience, then you're going to generate energy to support a foolish, ridiculous thought. And eventually it's going to be foolish behavior. So. Um, our thoughts and tensions regarding the issue have germinated and taken root. Then the next phase is the sprouting of the seed. Sprouting is an energetic response, emotions. Once rooted in these thoughts and intentions, so we, we had the experience, it got seeded in us, we generated a series of thoughts based on what the experience was, whether it's conditioned foolish thoughts or intelligent thoughts, and now we sprout, we have an energetic response a series of emotions, emotive energy, or externally moving energy. Once rooted in these thoughts and intentions, the next stage of the unfolding of, of our behavior is the emergence of energetic responses, reflecting the value associated with the thoughts. Your responses energetically or energetically are rooted in the kind of thoughts that you generate, what value you associated with your thoughts. Was it true? Was the value based on truth? Was it based on idiocy? based on idiocy or ignorance, then you're going to sprout some emotional reactions that are reflecting that ignorant, conditioned idea. If you ascribe the proper value to these, this experience, then the kind of emotional response you will generate will be a reflection of that intelligence. So, once rooted in these thoughts and intentions, the next stage of the unfolding of our behavior is emergence of energetic responses reflecting the value associated with the thoughts. We may therefore manifest anger, hurt, joy, exhilaration, fear, attraction, repulsion, etc. The seed has sprouted. What was below the surface, your thinking and intentions, now came above the surface because it sprouted. You have an emotional reaction. That's the first thing that people can see is a manifestation of what was happening inside you is the emotional reaction. So even if somebody punches you, the first thing is a flinch. That's an emotional reaction based on that sensory perception. And then you may have something to say after that. So, um, what was below the surface of Asase, for the Earth Mother, underground has emerged above the surface. The thoughts that were hidden in the internal recesses of our consciousness have now been forced, sprouted outward. That's an emotional reaction. Okay. Okay. Then the next phase, stage, is the flowering, maturation of the actions. Of course, you see every phase we're showing with the seeds and so forth. You have the emotional response, and then you have the full flower. Unfolding of our behavior is the manifestation of intentions, which are your actions. So you have an emotional response rooted in the thoughts that were generated, and now you have an action. You have a physical action. You're going to respond and do something. Our actions are rooted in the value we have ascribed to or recognized within the presenting issue and are powered by the energetic responses, emotional output associated with the value. So first you have certain values associated with the thoughts, you have an energetic response based on that, and then you begin to act. You're either going to act based on intelligent thoughts and some energy that powers intelligence thoughts, or you're going to act based on some ignorant thoughts, and you're going to use your energy to power ignorant thoughts, and that becomes self-destructive. But it's important to show the connection between the thoughts and the intentions and the energy responses. So, this is why we say um, powered by the energy responses, the emotional output, 
push associated with said value, the recognized or ascribed values that were hidden in the root energy of our being, the newt, that sacred space, as intentions have now fully flowered and matured. So you have some intentions, but then they, when you act, that's the manifestation of your intentions. Your intentions people can't see, but then when you act them out, people can see, oh, this is what you were thinking all along. If it was based on truth, then these actions are harmonious. If it's based on nonsense, then you engage in self-destructive activity. The actions, fruit, are the manifestation of intentions. We must also know that there are times when we intend to act yet are hindered from doing so. Somebody may stop you from acting. While we may visualize and or contemplate action, the action is never carried out. Like somebody may want to attack somebody, but they just happen to be locked up right now. So they can't do it, but they have that intention. But to visualize or contemplate the action, the action is never carried out. However, the visualization or contemplation of action set energy in motion and has a measurable effect on our um, awareness, our physiology, and future behavior, including the next harvesting seeding stage. So even if you don't get a chance to act, you're just visualizing something, you're so pissed on somebody, you're just constantly visualizing what you're going to do if it's out of harmony with order, because sometimes we need to visualize who we're going to attack because it's based on order. Let's not pretend like <laughs> always have to put that in there. We need to say that first. But when you visualize and contemplate something, you're already setting energy, energy in motion because just by virtue of the fact that if you close your eyes in this darkness and then you generate luminous forms, just like if you're dreaming. Nope, if you're dreaming in a room, laying in a room in the dark, Nobody else is in the room, there's no light, there's no sound, but you're having experiences, you're generating luminous images within your consciousness because there are no luminous images in the room. So that means your spirit is generating an energetic response just by virtue of the fact that it's luminous and moving, that is energy. So whenever you contemplate something or visualize something, you're setting energy in motion, even if you don't act on it. If it's self-destructive, then that can cause you to implode if it's not the kind of energy you need. If, you, you know, if you're frustrated or stressed and so forth, and you're constantly visualizing and contemplating something that you don't know how to get out of, then it becomes implosive. And that affects your you know, physiology. That's frustration and stress. That's different than fire and righteous anger when you wage war against the enemy. That's a totally different thing. So, then the harvesting and seeding phase, the final stage in the unfolding of our behavior, is the harvesting of the fruits, the labor of our actions. We act in order to obtain a certain result, to affect a specific outcome. The results, effects of our actions are absorbed by us. This absorption leads to new seed formation. It is a renewal of the cycle for our absorption of the results, effects of our actions is the perception and reception of the results, effects of our actions. This perception and reception is the planting of a new seed into our awareness, and the behavioral cycle begins once again. It is a return to the first position. So when you harvest something after you act it, then you harvest the results of you know, what, what happened. What are the ramifications of what you did to somebody or, or engaged some activity? What is the aftermath of that? Then you harvest that. If there's something harmonious that is good for you, you harvest it, and you can utilize that for the good of yourself and, and the Aparakani Aparakani nation. If you engage in self-destructive behavior, you start selling drugs and doing other things, then the result of that, you're going to harvest the result of that. And the ramifications of that is grave for our community. So that's that cycle of seeding, that contact, and then germinating, rooting, then sprouting, full flowering, and then harvesting. And then once you harvest the fruits, take the seeds out, and seed once again. So you receive the harvest, but then you go back, or even if the fruits fall on the ground and they rot, but then the seeds go embed themselves in the earth and it starts all over again. So that's that cycle. The same seeding cycle is the unfolding of our behavior. Every time we engage in an action, we went through that whole cycle in a nanosecond. We went through the whole process. We went through seeding, we went through germination rooting, we went through sprouting, um, full flowering, and harvesting. Every time we act, every, every thought process, it goes through that. And this is why we have this cosmogram, because it's showing that contact, the white circle, 
then going down to the black circle, which is the germination, the rooting, going deep down within the darkness, then the sprouting, the rising of the sun, and so forth, then the full flowering, the full energy of the sun, and then the harvesting at the harvest time, but also the seeding again. We go through that cycle every time we have a thought that manifests as an action, constantly. So when you have a cosmogram that deals with that and shows that, you're not dealing with pseudo-psychology where they're just talking about, you know, um, unrelated thoughts, desires, behaviors, conditionings, and so forth. We have an orderly cyclical process. Okay. And then we just talk about the hemispheres and the quadrants. We talked about Tawi, the upper part of Earth, and that which is on the surface. We talked about the Tuat, which is the lower hemisphere, which deals with what is under the Earth, ancestors and ancestors, but also what's under your perception, your thoughts, intentions that people can't see readily at first. But then we want to talk about the right and left hemispheres, quadrants. The wab, which means purification, ritual purification, right, right hemisphere. Then the left hemisphere, cultural purification and governing, which is directly related to Amaniye nations. Ma'at, female aspect of the divine law. Ma'al, the male aspect of the divine law. And the center point is the ka, the ka'at, the soul, the divine consciousness. Everything is revolving around it. Every thought, intention, and action is revolving around that center point, which is here. But then you have these different quadrants. Down. Okay, so we talk about the upper hemisphere. Um, the right hemisphere, the wab, represents the influence of the deities, divine spirit forces in nature, the lower right quadrant, and their earthly representatives, the community of healers and healeresses, the tr traditional priests and priestesses, the upper right quadrant. And then you have the left hemisphere, the ucha represents the influence of the honorable ancestresses and ancestors, lower left quadrant, and their earthly representatives, the honorable elders and eldresses, the upper left quadrant. If we go down a little bit, I want to show that um, uh, model real quick, and then we're going to go back up. Right there. Okay. So, the deities, of course this is in the, um, the right hemisphere we're talking about, lower quadrant, the deities, the forces in nature, spiritual forces that you don't see, but they're governing various events. Then the Abosomfo, priests and priestesses, they are the vessels through whom the deities operate. So on the surface, you can see what the deities are trying to convey to us. So in this right quadrant, we're talking about that purification ritually, ritual purification. The forces in nature in the under, quote unquote, underworld, and then on the surface world, the vessels of the Abosom, the vessels of the forces in nature. Then you have the left quadrant over here, the underworld, the ancestresses and ancestors, and then their physical representatives are the elders and the elderses. The Mpanyifo, they're the ones on earth, the spirits are, quote unquote, in the underworld, so to speak. So you have the ritual life that impacts the cultural life. You have the ritual life that impacts or influences the way we govern ourselves on a daily basis. The elders and eldresses should be, should be repositories of the wisdom of the clan and of the nation. And that has to do with governance, sound systems of governance and jurisprudence. So when we're talking about wab, we're talking about purification, ritual purification. When we're talking about uchat, we're talking about cultural purification. This is happening, and then of course the individual is the one in the center. Just like in the cosmogram, the center is your ka, your ka, your soul, your divine consciousness, and all your behaviors revolve around the ka, the kaet. Well, the individual here, as well as the nation, is in the center, and the deities, the ancestral spirits, the representatives of the deities and ancestral spirits on earth, healers and healers in your clan, in your family, as well as honorable elders and eldresses within your clan, within your family, they govern ritual life and cultural life that makes up a harmonious, balanced nation. If we don't understand the impact that the deities, ancestral spirits have directly on our society as an Afrakani, Afrakani nation, then we'll pretend that we can have a secular nationalism. 
can't have a secular natural. There's no such thing. The, our mind is a living, organic entity with the spirit that governs it, as we talked about in, in the piece dealing with um, Amania. So there's no such thing as secular nationalism. So if you say, well, we don't want to get into religion, so we're just going to be nationalists and come together based on what you know pulls us together, which is our oppression, you're already in the crackers um, ideology from the gate. So you doomed your whole movement from the gate. And the crackers knew that from the gate. So they, they didn't care about people talking about one God, one aim, one destiny, and that kind of thing, because that was just an announcement and an enun enunciation of monotheism. That's all it was. Now, Garvey didn't know that, and some of the other people who were following, following that movement, and even before him, were getting involved in Christianity or, you know, Moorish Hebrewism and all this other, other nonsense and uh, masonry, even in the so-called late 1800s, you have Martin Delaney, other people getting involved in Prince Hall masonry and all these different things. They didn't know any better at the time because that's what they thought they needed to be doing. The Whites and Offspring didn't mind that because they created those ideologies to keep us locked down. The only people who freed our people were the ones who understood this structure instinctively. They invoke the Abosom, they utilize the healers and healeresses, the hoodoo men, hoodoo women in the family, to poison the whites in their offspring, engage in chemical and biological warfare, as well as fashioning metal armaments and so forth, that inform the kind of elders and eldresses we have, because we have Nsamampo who understand divine order, so that regulated our thoughts, intentions, and actions, and therefore we wage war and engage in revolutionary, resolutionary activity. Those are the people who freed us. We're sitting here free physically from physical enslavement because of those people who maintain ancestral religion. Those who did not, they were trying to petition for other things. Those who did not are still petitioning for other things now. <laughs> petitioning. You're going to petition the cracker. Your cells in your body are not like petitioning cancerous cells. Like we're going to just fill out some forms and we're going to protest until you all stop eating everybody else. That ain't working. Right. <laughs> right. Can healthy cells having to sit in on cancerous cells. <laughs> Singing songs. All right. So, um, <laughs> so go back up. Okay. So uh, I'm going to go to the Ucha section. Um, <coughs> Well, actually, no, we can go back up to the wild section just a little bit. But, uh, that's, that's good. So, that, so we say here, we're impacted by the spirit forces in nature and their ritual specialists, traditional healers, healers within our families. Notice we're talking about within our families because we're part of clans. We have a blood circle, especially in the Western Hemisphere, we have blended blood circles. So we have ancestresses and ancestors of these blended blood circles based on the way, not only did we blend blood circles, which is unique in and of itself, but still ancestresses and ancestors, and we come from specific land, but we blended blood circles in this region, interfacing with Asasea Fua and Asasea in this region. So this is why we did the broadcast. We have a locative identity based on our uh, blood circle confusion on this region of Asasea Fua, which causes us to have a different approach so like, just like the foods over here, we may have developed an either an allergen with regard to certain plant life and animal life that doesn't exist on the continent, or we developed a tolerance for it. So we can eat certain foods, somebody who's related to us DNA-wise on the continent, we find out that we're our con or something, we get our DNA tested, we go to the continent and we connect with them, they come over here and try to eat some, you know, um, coca or something like that that's grown over here or some, some other kind of plant life and they can't take it because we have adjusted to this region of Asasea for they, they haven't lived over here so they haven't incorporated that into their physiological structure and developed some form of immunity to certain things. So we can deal with it, they can. The same thing spiritually, the way that energy moves in the region of Asasea for the way that energy moves in the northern hemisphere is different. This is why we take advantage of the equinoxes, for example, and the solstices, and we put an emphasis on that here in North America. So we have our New Year celebration, or, and it's calibrated to the uh, autumn equinox. On the continent, they can shift from August, September to October. The Negroes on the continent is talking about January 1st. Happy New Year. <laughs> 
<laughs> the darkest, coldest time of the year. Only cave dwellers living in the ice. <laughs> See, it's, it's dark, it's cold, shortest time of the year, it's midnight, happy new year. Only cave dwellers will say that. Anybody else who lives in the sun, when things start sprouting or when, when it's the end of a warm cycle and the seeding cycle of conception or, or rebirth, then that's, those are two times for a beginning. Not when everything is dead, dark, cold, and lifeless, and then you say happy new year. So, um, so the key is, so, so when we talk about that, it's related to the solstices and the equinoxes. If you were living in Ghana, for example, the temperature on December 21st is not that much different than it is June 21st. It may be a little bit hotter on June 21st, but it's warm the whole time. There's a marked shift in the temperature on December 21st in Chicago than it is on June 21st. You could be 10 degrees below zero and, you know, 100 degrees. So there's a shift in energy that we take advantage of and the equinoctial points as well. And that infusion of energy is so marked that we take advantage of it through these celebrations, these conferences and so forth, these ritual practices. So that's something different that we would do here because we live in the West, but we also live in the, the Northern Hemisphere as well as the Western Hemisphere. We're living in that Northwest quadrant, so to speak. So we're going to engage differently. We'll have certain dietary taboos, social, and others that they do not have. The third, so we have that locative identity. The way we blended blood circles in relationship to our interfaces with this region of the Earth Mother creates a locative identity that no other group of people has, and we have to acknowledge that reality. And the Abosom and Insamapo who govern us based on that locative identity. So, the Wab is talking about spirit forces in nature, ritual specialists in our families. We are impacted by the positive and proper guidance of the elders and eldresses, the repositories of wisdom and culture within our blood circles, within our clans. When we talk about in our families, healers and healerses, meaning ancestrally inherited healers and healers. Spirit genetically inherited, transcarnationally inherited. Not just spending seven eight thousand dollars flying to Nigeria, getting a couple of pots, coming back, and then you have to make a bunch of calls over there to see how to use your pot for the next 10, 15 years, and then you're still raising my up. All that kind of thing. We're not that's what we talk about. We brought these healing practices in our blood circle, and we still have them. So the forces in nature, we're impacted by. We're impacted by the ancestresses and ancestors. Our perception, thoughts, intentions, energetic responses, actions, and harvesting, absorption of the repercussions of our actions are not separated from this physical and spiritual matrix within which we function. So when we talk about the forces of nature and so forth, and when you scroll down a little bit, the Uchat, that ritual um, piece, <laughs> no, I'm just um, that's good. The values we ascribe to events, actions, dilemmas, etc., are shaped by our adherence to culture. So you're talking about the ritual peace, ritual life in this hemisphere, cultural life in this hemisphere. So when we talk about everything is political, everything is religious, everything is cultural. It's, there's no separation. The whites and offspring can say everything is political, but there's some things are religious and some things are not. When you are children of the forces in nature and you're impacted by that, there's no such thing as secularism. It's impossible. If you're standing outside and the energy of the sun is beating upon you, but the spirits that animate the sun can possess you, then there's no separation. There's no such thing as secularism. So a black person, an Afro-Akani, Afro-Akani person cannot engage in secular nationalism. They can't engage in some amorphous nationalism or rudderless pan-Africanism that's abstract. They can't engage in any messianic nationalism where you have a prophetic leader who's, you know, going to lead the people to the promised land. That's all white dogma. It was fashioned and formed and planted and seeded within the consciousness of our people to keep any revolutionary, resolutionary movement from jumping off because they saw the real movements were those rooted in reality ritual life leading, impacting, and informing cultural life, and then we wage war against the enemy based on that reality. And then we move forward quite naturally and organically to reestablish a territory, a newt, a state, a nation, a, a place 
that we can operate in a harmonious fashion that we can defend, whether we do that in the Western Hemisphere or we do that on the continent. And we, people will do both. Some people go to the continent and establish that space. We're not just talking about moving to the continent and blending in and just trying to become an imitation of a modern day Ghanaian or Nigerian or something and walk and stand and sit like them and that kind of thing. So your neck, you know what I'm saying? I'm <laughs> not talking about that. <laughs> and we're not talking about, you know, just we're talking about establishing an independent territory. Akin to, they established Liberia, but the whites and offspring set that up specifically to create division between the native population and the brainwashed population from here, so we can go over there and start trying to make them Christians and wearing top hats and walking with canes and everything, looking crazy. So, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about establishing a territory that's independent, our own nation. Some nations will cede some territory when they see it's a group, a collective who are all on the same page and it's beneficial for not only for us, for, but for them as well. They see it's just a bunch of secular nationalists running around saying, hey, we need some land, we need to come together, and it's a bunch of Christians, both of them, Hebrews, Muabians, all kinds of other clowns talking about we're coming to Africa to give us some territory. They won't even concede, consider that. So, plus, when we get back on track, we have the same, a few generations back, the same ancestors and ancestors that they have. So you have some, you have a brother and sister who are living on the continent. One of them gets snatched up and sent to America. The other one lives there. All their descendants are living on the continent. And the other one's descendants are living here. You go back a few generations, we have the same relatives. And those relatives who are ancestors and ancestors now impact them to say, you better give up some territory now that they've gotten themselves together. Because if you do not, then you're going to have problems as well, economic as well as military. Military coming from the crack, it may even be military coming from over here. But some things have not been resolved. We're talking about over here from our people. Some things haven't been resolved. Some of them did send us over. Some of them were enemies. We're not just going to be like, okay, we forgive everybody. That ain't, that ain't happening. So, talking about ritual life and cultural life. So, and that impacts. So there's no such thing as secular nationalism, no such thing as messianic nationalism, no such thing as amorphous nationalism. This is why we're dealing with nationism. A nation is an entity. It's governed by a spirit. Every natural cell within that organ is governed by the organ, just like the liver cells. All of them functioning harmoniously are governed by the liver entity itself. We naturally coalesce in a region because we're pulled together by the ancestors and ancestors and the abosom. So there are certain deities that actually govern us in that coalition. So the nation itself is a living organic entity governed by a spirit, so there's no separation between ancestry religion and nation building. So nationism is the purification of nationalism, it's the restoration of a real nationalism. So we're moving in that direction. Some people will stay in what they've been doing. They can like the brother said, they, they could be in an organization in the 70s and 40 years later, they're still in that organization, still having meetings, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, 10 to 15 people coming out 40 years later saying, we, we, we got to move forward. But some people just don't know, they just, we've never been given proper information. We started off learning from the whites and offspring that we can never take our people out of Christianity, Islam, the faith, religions. We can't deal with the ritual life. We don't really understand the cultural life. Let's scroll up just up, up a little bit. We don't understand the ritual life because we've been cut off from the ancestry as far as consciously. We talk about culture, dealing with the elders and elderses, but we don't deal with the unsumafo, so we're working in this quadrant alone, and even that is truncated. Everything else, three-fourths, you know, is gone. So then we build a strategy of liberation based on a truncated version of this, this quadrant. So we say, we will never get our people out of Christianity, so let's just meet our people where they are. In fact, we're going to create a philosophy where we don't attack people's religion because that's just going to create division. So you're impotent. You, you built a strategy of liberation based on your impotence. We can't do this, therefore we're going to build a whole approach based on I'm impotent. I can't do anything, so I'm going to do this. You castrated yourself from the beginning. 
And so now you're trying to have a strategy, and that's what you have. You start having the meetings in the 70s, and then 50, 40 years later, you're still having the same meeting. But we've been conditioned like that. When we get back into our culture, we eradicate Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, Morishism, all of that nonsense from the minds of our people because we deal with real information, so those characters never existed. We destroy that. That's the foundation. That ritual life, the foundation, the Abosom and Insamapo, that supports the cultural, the ritual and cultural life on the surface. If you don't deal with the ancestral religion, which is the foundation, then everything on the surface is going to be meaningless. So we don't build a strategy based on impotence or castration. We build a strategy based on reality, and we can move forward. That's the difference between nationism or amanie and nationalism. It's rooted in our ancestral culture, ancestral religion. Everything is political, everything is religious, everything is cultural. So that's the presentation. engage the ritual life and they only deal with the cultural life and then they're not even engaging the example there and they're just dealing with the truncated version of the cultural life and the kind of governing structures they put forward or strategies to stop police violence as you were talking about and everything else is going to be based on hands up don't shoot and all, all these different things because there's no foundation and then I see the parallel between the um you know, the horizontal line and the vertical line, my, my, I mean, my, my, um, when you say it's the gateway from the physical world to the spiritual world, and then in my eye, it's the ritual and the culture, the, well, the cultural and ritual. Right. Right? So, right. when the physical world dealing with the culture and the spiritual world, the spirit world dealing with the ritual. Right. 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 So, that's the dividing line, and it's a gateway. You're moving, even just moving from east to west, it's a gateway from east to west, so to speak. Um, and even when you look east to west, and you see the temples of the days and so forth in the east, 
and in the west, as you see the ancestresses and ancestors with the land of the set of sun, but when the sun sets, it penetrates the ground, then it begins to harden. So we talk about how Tim sitting in the red setting sun, and when he sits in the red setting sun, the sun sets, and then Tim also means the end completion, the end of a day, the end of a cycle, but it also means hard, compact substance. So our Tim's energy gets into the ground, goes into the underworld, but it hardens it. So just like you have clay, that's soft and you have water and you're fashioning the clay, but then you put it in the oven to harden it to make it a compact, hard substance. Once you engage the ritual life and then the sun sets on that kind of energy, then you can harden it and make it a concrete thing. But if you don't engage in ritual life, what are you concretizing? We're concretizing nonsense and then we're operating on something that we have concretized as self destructive So we have to have all four quadrants. And that that cycle of life prepare on to governs every aspect of our being. And you think that um, your, your perspective is that we as a people, we're only in not even one quadrant? Well, the way we've been conditioned. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we have the we have it all, but we neglect it. Right. When it shows up, we bat it right back down. <laughs> when the, you know, the desires come forward or the direction come forward, we like nod them. But now we just come forward and we affirm what people are. So we don't have to put something in people. Like the white and offspring try to indoctrinate people, indoctrinate people in a negative fashion. We already have it. People are denying to, to their detriment physiologically as well as spiritually. You're going insane, they're hearing ancestors and ancestors, but the cracker said you're not hearing something. But you are hearing something. But they said you're not hearing something, so it must be something wrong with you. Now you're taking medication. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or you're so depressed because you're hearing something that nobody else is hearing then people become catatonic and they just start checking out of reality because they don't want to focus on the reality because it's too painful to focus on it when nobody else is. So they just focus on something else and their hygiene suffers and people say they're ill and so forth. And then they set themselves up because they, you know, um, reduce their spiritual immunity to be assaulted by other discarnate kind of wayward type and such spirits or unrelated spirits. Just like you reduce your physical immunity, you compromise the body not getting enough sleep or eating wrong and so forth. Then the bacteria that normally just bounces off of you all day long, it has an entry point or a number of entry points and now it can take you down, which otherwise it would just, your immune system would knock it right out. So when people become depressed like that, they open up these um, large holes, quote unquote, in their aura, it becomes porous. And now the bacterial, the viral type discarded spirits can get in and begin to influence suggest that you need to be a homo bisexual and they hear it and they're like, yeah, I must need to be that. Or some child molester who was a rapist, some child molester walking around, they're deceased now. Normally you can repel those perverse thoughts, but now that you're depressed and spiritually, you know, compromised, immune-wise, now you're hearing that. And then when you hear it, then the only place you go is to the therapist or the pastor. And they're like, well, that's just because that's who you've always been ever since you were a child, so you need to follow that stop denying and the reason you're depressed is because you're denying who you really are. As opposed to, that's a molester that you need to not be paying attention to, and if you repel him, then the thoughts are gone because they were never yours in the first place. So when we use ancestral religion, including the cosmic realm, we can end the sexuality overnight. Because you can repel the discarnate kind of spirit, the thoughts are gone because they were never yours in the first place. That's the danger of the crackers, that's the benefit of the uh, danger for their agenda. But we can free ourselves from all that. So, so we're suppressing things. We don't have to indoctrinate people per se. All we have to do is give them, um, validate what they already experience. And instead of them suppressing it, they're like, wait a minute, this is what I was, was the whole time. So that, that's the key. Sacred space. Um, can you invoke 
using this in a model. Right. So all of these symbols, just like identical symbols, which is the same as Medutu and other symbols, just like the, the Bakango and, and other Bantu-speaking people, mm -hmm. they utilize the Ikinga Dia Congo, you know, that symbol as just like in Vodun, Veves are used. I think the symbols function as Veves as well. Symbols are really shrines and miniatures. So if you have a, any shape generates its own configuration of energy. So when you look at a shape, if you're looking at a circle, just like if you're staring at somebody, people can feel you staring at them. You know what I'm saying? Life force energy is moving towards them. And you apprehend the shape, the life force energy moves from you. It starts moving through a circle, it creates a vortex of energy. If it's a triangle, it moves in that you know, structure and it generates a different vortex of energy. If it's a combination of triangle, circle, octagon, whatever, it's generating a configuration of energy unique to that specific form. That unique configuration of energy is a shrine in and of itself. Now, we fashion our Dinkra symbols and Beves and cosmograms and so forth based on, that, that's why deities have specific structures associated with them. You'll say a triangle is associated with somebody, and a circle and different ones because of the energy that they emanate is reflective of a specific geometric pattern. So yes, these are used as, just like Adinkra symbols are not just worn on clothes, but they're used on shrines, shrine houses, tattoos, but they're utilized, drawn in the soil or sand. You see an Aboso and possess somebody and draw a specific shape in the sand. This is where we learn those symbols from in the first place. So yes, that's used as a symbol. Actually, I'm not saying that. Yeah, I said that. Um,